Okay, well, we can easily, as we know, already saw, we can easily YouTube or Google you in order to, to find out how, <laughs> where to get questions. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. We're going in order, right, Mira? Yeah, okay. So Professor Frank Norbert Bittman, who's the head of the Department of Regulatory Physiology and Prevention at the University of Potsdam. Um, but I did uh, look a little into what you're working on, and it's really a nice, I think a really unique combination, because not only is Professor Bitterman working on complex biological processes as a basis for health, which is of course something very relevant and important, part of what we're hearing about today, but also works on um, disease prevention and has incorporated in his research, I don't know if we'll hear about that today, sports and therapy. And that's, of course, a particular interest, not only worldwide, but at Tel Aviv University now. And you are uh, in Germany, the chair of an association for health promotion, but also Society for Sports Medicine. So I think it's really a wonderful combination. And past, okay, but, but clearly active in, in the topic. So we look forward to hearing what you have to tell us today. Thank you very much, um, Professor Abraham, dear Mira. I'm very proud to be here and grateful to receive this uh, kind invitation. And um, I enjoy every minute uh, to be here in this unique environment and this inspiring uh, meeting. Um, it's, uh, I, I have sat here and, and thought it's very hard to, to have a speech after this uh, 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 very inspiring and um, uh, uh, wonderful uh, speech of uh, this uh, great scientist in, uh, prior to me. Uh, but I hope you are open to switch from microbiology to uh, more macrobiology uh, because it's going about some um, biomechanic um, biomechanic measurements. Um, we discussed uh, what could I uh, tell uh, and we agreed okay tell about integrative appro approaches uh, for the treatment of orthopedic conditions. Very uh, different things and some of the uh, orthopedic conditions I guess a run without leukocytes uh, function, and um, that's, uh, that's my topic right now. Okay, let's start um, with the evidence-based medicine. Today we uh, more than one time heard about evidence medicine around about 20 years. It dominates uh, the, the research in the medical world, um, but it is defined as underpinned on two pillars. The, the first pillar is the best external evidence. And there is another pillar. This is on the right. Oh, um, uh, it's nearly invisible to, to find. And um, this depicts uh, actually the, uh, the situation we have right now. Um, that's why we have own, uh, around about 99.99% uh, papers about the left pillar. And over the years, I found only one uh, uh, publication on the right side. And let me take a magnifier. Um, this is the individual clinical expertise. And that's, uh, I, I'd like to focus today on this right side and I hope you are open to follow me to for some minutes, minutes to think outside of the box. Okay, uh, my, my opening question is, uh, are orthopedic complaints um, personal destiny? Um, all of you know uh, examples of those complaints. Maybe uh, there is, uh, there are some persons suffering from uh, such an orthopedic complaint um, <clears throat> because of the short time. I won't speak about it in particular. Um, of course, we have uh, a lot of results out from the uh, evidence-based medicine and it provides uh, a lot of risk factors getting those compliance uh, like load, age, a very important factor, mental 
um, mental uh, stress, maybe. Um, but from our point of view, these are these are findings uh, out of comparisons between big uh, or large patient groups, and um, the probability to help a single person uh, mainly is very low. It's because an uh, individual person is not a group. So the question is, can we use these risk factors to help a single person? There is only one person face to face to the physician. And, um, um, and if you speak with orthopedic uh, physicians, they tell you there are a lot of uh, patients like those, a young runner with uh, pain of Achilles uh, tendon, but he has uh, not a, a large amount of load, or uh, a lot of patients have knee pain, but there is nothing in the image to find. Or on the other hand, we have uh, large damages uh, in the images, but um, the patient is uh, free of pain. Yeah? As we know, there is uh, no correlation between the image and the complaints. How can it be? Or a last uh, example, a tennis elbow. Most uh, persons with tennis, tennis elbow don't play tennis or do anything like this. Okay, so our conclusion um, coming from a lot of years practicing with patients as in many cases the risk factors delivered from the evidence-based medicine are nearly useless for the treatment of a single person. What we have to understand is uh, what is the individual cause, the individual genesis of these problems. And over the years we uh, observed, not only we, a thousand of therapists, um, especially um, osteopaths, uh, chiropractors, physiotherapists, observed that there is uh, in numerous uh, patients a regular lack of a very specific kind of motor action. Everybody uh, focuses on the structure, but what about the function? And this is uh, what is interesting for us. And what kind of motor action do, uh, do I mean? Um, we call it the forgotten motor function. And um, this, is, uh, this picture shows uh, and young athletes come uh, down to the ground after a jump. And as you see, he produces a lot of force while the muscle is contracting backward. This is a very special function, and surprisingly, uh, nearly nobody deals with it. The function is to decelerate, dropping down after jump, and this function all of us need, uh, um, literally, on every step we do. Okay. <laughs> Especially when you walk downstairs or downhill, you have uh, absorbed your body weight during walking, literally with every, every step. This backward contraction might be the, the decisive thing. A, a different example, you get an, a heavy item and have to adapt your muscle strength to its weight. Or another thing to hold uh, a force uh, uh, on the right example, uh, created by winds into the sail, or another uh, example, you are skiing downhill and uh, every second you have to adapt to the forces uh, coming from the ground. Okay, to hold against varying forces, this is our essential point, the ability to adapt to forces coming from external. That's why we call this special um, action adaptive motor action, or we published it under the term adaptive force. Okay, and surprisingly, nobody uh, measures this. So it's not mentioned in the textbooks of the motor science. There is only poor research in this field. What we find uh, shows uh, a little bit, uh, we know uh, probably 
uh, during this adaptive motor action, this uh, backward contraction, the muscle needs less energy and the peripheral nervous system shows lower activity. But on the other hand, the, the brain shows a higher activity because there is more to process. The measurements have to process and uh, we have, uh, uh, the, the brain has uh, to calculate the right answer uh, to the external forces. So it seems so uh, that the central control of adaptive motor actions seems to be more complicated and our hypothesis is it can be easily disturbed by any irritation of the neural system. So what we know uh, relative uh, secure is that muscle injuries um, occur due to adaptive actions, backward contraction. You cannot create a, a torn muscle fiber or a, a pulled muscle um, by contracting forward. It's impossible. Okay, and that's why we looked for a possibility to measure this special function, this specific function, and we have seen uh, all over the world there's no device able to, de to measure this specific function, and uh, that's the reason why we began to construct uh, different um, devices uh, what we he see here is uh, an early version of these devices. Now we have one for the knee and one for the elbow, <coughs> and it works uh, on the pneumatic uh, principle. The system increases the force, but it's, it is up to the subject to resist as long as possible by holding stable, and then there will be one point and uh, on this, the muscle will be overwhelmed. The holding force uh, is at its limit, and then the subject begin to yield, begins to yield. It gives in. Um, and uh, now this is uh, hard to understand. Um, during the yielding, uh, yielding, the muscle increases its force. We have a yielding muscle, but it increases its force to a top force. Okay, let's have a, a graph um, uh, and look at a measurement of a proper functioning muscle. Below you see the, the course of the ankle. Um, first we have a stable phase, we call it uh, isometric phase. And as you can see, the angle of the elbow doesn't change and after it we have a yielding phase. Uh, the muscle gives in and uh, the elbow changes its uh, position. Um, and during this yielding, whoops, just why it's five. Uh, do we have a pointer here? In the middle. In the middle. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. Um, during the yielding phase, uh, we the muscle reaches maximum is its top force, but during yielding, the decisive moment for us uh, is the moment of the, oh, of the yielding start. And in this case, this is a proper functioning muscle. Uh, this uh, beginning of yielding is around about 28% uh, of the, t uh, the, the peak force. This is a good functioning muscle. The same muscle under uh, uh, irritating conditions works like this. It's the same muscle, but it is affected by a disturbance. And as you can see, the stable phase is much shorter and the yielding phase very long. The peak force it reaches is even higher than under proper function, but decisive. Uh, let's look at the start of the yielding. This, the, the force level when the muscle starts to yield is very low. In this case, we have 56%. Okay, there are two different kinds of control of motor action, and what does, does that mean? 
we can we can compare both uh, behaviors in this fourth angle plot. Um, the green line shows the the proper functioning muscle, as we uh, can see. The top force is very high, and the point of yielding is nearby. There is only a small difference between both. Under disturbed contraction uh, uh, conditions, we have even a higher peak force, but the moment of yielding is at a very low level. And these two, uh, two arrows maybe show the difference uh, that could be explained why a joint or a muscle or a tendon or a ligament uh, develop a pain. This is maybe the uh, decisive different. Um, so we, we can say an effective muscle control, uh, affected muscle control does not reduce the maximum strength. It's not up to the force. That's why athletes have complaints too. They have enough force. The decisive thing is the muscle yields at a low force level. We have two uh, controls uh, running parallel, one control function for the force and the, uh, the other one for the length. Okay, and if uh, the muscle yields at a low level of force, this makes a, a joint instable. For instance, you are skiing and you are turning over your knee and uh, the muscle uh, yields at a low level of force, you turn, you turn uh, a wide range and maybe a ligament is dis uh, damaged after it. Or an uh, 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 injury, an injury we have, uh, we, we see very often somebody have an injury of the ankle uh, every month. Yeah, what's going on? And we have a, a, a special group of muscles which uh, could, protect it, could protect us from injuries um, like this. And in those cases, the, the maximum holding force of this peroneus muscle group, it's so called, um, doesn't, uh, is very low. And the other point, when the muscle is in, in these uh, special conditions, it develops. Uh, it develops uh, pain at the tendons and other points. This is an um, alternative explanation for the generation of muscle or joint uh, problems. So to uh, come to the end, um, the uh, main point was to speak about integrative uh, conceptions of medicine. Uh, this is uh, a very simplified a picture of the motor control system, um, but the the question is, what agents could affect this system? And we have found over the years there is a, a broad vari variety of uh, different uh, problems, uh, health problems. Uh, very often we have dental problems, jaw stress, or myofascial, or uh, one of the most important things are mental impairments like uh, traumas, which influence the motor control of the muscles. And um, the, the point is to find uh, in the individual case what is the reason for his problem. And um, if you in, uh, identify it, you can easily choose the right therapy. and. Know the integrative, know the integrative medicine around Potsdam and uh, uh, Berlin. We have um, a network, a broad network of partners, and uh, we work together uh, with them in order to find the right treatment for uh, indiv for an individual person. And you see the the spectrum of possible treatments or medical disciplines is very wide. Um, the art is to find the right tool. We have a need for a broad a toolbox and um, uh, to, to network with other specialties. Okay, uh, so far for me. Um, thanks very much for your attention. It was great to be here.
Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Please, Uri. So, so just an ignorant question. Would you advise, given, given what you've just shown us, as a preventive measure, that yeah. people, when they think about exercise, they use a form of exercise that moves muscles in, an, um, in many different ways, so like dance and martial arts, rather yeah. than just, let's say, jogging or weightlifting. And that may, may help prevent some of these uh, pains and, and, and muscle problems. Yeah, thank you for the question. The answer is uh, we have individual conditions. You can uh, uh, hire or uh, get problems uh, from nearly each kind of, of activity. So I, I cannot say don't dance or do this or, or that. Uh, what we know, uh, a very new disease is um, a tennis arm uh, from working with a computer mouse. This is incredible. This is not a load. What, what we suggest is uh, check the individual pattern of muscle function. And there are a lot of very simple done clinical tests. This is a measuring by a machine, but we can do it by clinical tests and uh, uh, check around about 30 muscles and I can say, you, uh, okay, you have a problem with this and this and this uh, system and then we can look what is the reason. And if we delete all reasons, you can do everything you want. <laughs> so I have a quick question following on to what he just said. When you're in studying these problems, do you incorporate the fascia as well? I mean, do you put together with not only the musculature, but the surrounding yes. packaging? Yes, this is a very important. Uh, factor what we have seen over the years, myofascial problems usually are uh, following a disturbed control of muscle, fu muscle function. First, the control is out of order, and if you stress this uh, dysfunctioning muscle, you create myofascial uh, facial things, uh, issues, and uh, uh, but nevertheless, you, ha you have to lead these myofascial uh, problems too. Does, does that mean you can use pressure points and Yes. Sometimes uh, uh, a trigger point, a point uh, or something like this, or an ad 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 adhesive um, fa fascia uh, would, is created by a disturbed muscle function, but it creates uh, an, another disturbing of muscle function. This is a circular sweatiosis. Uh, I just have one yeah. remark to the end, uh, looking on what you presented in all the broad band that you are looking on this issue. I think this place is also a very special place to try and collaborate, you know, with the values of the Dead Sea from sports to the water to the, to the mud and others, and you are very invited. So I do have a question, um, or more of a comment. I was very intrigued by what you said about the genetics. So are there investigators who are integrating the phenomena you're finding in, in sports and medicine with genetic components? Yes, not yet. Okay, okay. There's, there's room for that. This is, this is a connection yeah. we, we, we didn't think about. Yeah. There's room for that. The, the only limitation, I think, I mean, other than finance, you know, budgets for those kind of sequencing is, is the large number of individuals that you need to have in order for it to have a good, yeah, significance, right? That's actually going to, we're going to, in our next